we all know that there's no way to solve all your problems with one line of code or that PHP will rule away all other um, languages. There's no chance for this. So there is no real magic we can do here. Um, but I try to show you some examples. Um, I or the PHP user group Dortmund and uh, other friends of me developed the last years and uh, which contain something which you could consider somehow magic or perhaps just wired. Um, okay, before we come uh, to the agenda, please ask questions. Um, the talk, I show a lot of examples, uh, completely different applications and later I will go into uh, in some background work, but really, please ask uh, questions. I have several issues of uh, PHP Architect here. If I hear good questions which I like, um, you can get, if you want, one issue of it. So, a little motiva motivation to ask more questions. About me, my name is Koro Nordmann, as you already heard. Um, I'm currently studying computer science in Dortmund. I am working for Easy Systems, as you may have recognized, uh, for the Easy Components, especially Easy Graph. Um, I'm maintainer in a in, and or developer in several open source projects at the moment. There's uh, no sense to name them all. I'm uh, sometimes uh, I write for several magazines. I wrote two books you perhaps read about. I. Um, a regular speaker at conferences, so you perhaps heard my name, but this all does not really matter. Let's come to the agenda. We'll start with some senseless, funny stuff you can do with PHP. Perhaps it inspires you somehow, but um, this won't be application which have any real sense. Um, when considering PHP, I see uh, some more technologies involved here, like um, yes, the usual HTML, but also SVG, ECMAScript, web servers. There's a complete ecosystem which um, affects us when we are developing web applications. Um, in the second part, I, I described some interesting stuff we did combining those uh, technologies. And if you have enough time left, I come to uh, some more interesting backend stuff. There will be some SPL included, some, uh, you know, the uh, standard PHP library introduced with PHP 5. We come to that, but it's not uh, a center topic of my talk. Any questions so far or something you want to say? Good. A question I um, hear quite regularly when uh, giving support in IRC channels is um, can you do ray tracing with PHP? Can you do language inter interpreters with PHP? Is there anything you can't do with PHP? We all know that uh, PHP is Turing complete so you can do really everything you want with PHP. You can do with other uh, computer languages. This is a ray tracer, an image of, uh, uh, with a ray tracer I wrote in PHP uh, some time ago. So ray tracing is a, a, a standard example for, for uh, applications you really won't expect with PHP, but of course it can be done. Ray tracing is nothing more, the basic ray tracing is nothing more than uh, a line polygon intersection algorithms and yes, some recursive uh, ray casting and that's everything you need. Um, PHP is a bit slow, too slow for this. This is an image uh, using, uh, it was about 10 or 12 polygons. It was uh, 100 uh, pixel width and height. And uh, I think I used four times anti-aliasing for this image. And it took about seven minutes and my computer with uh, two gigabytes of RAM started swapping very quickly. So PHP is not the optimal technology for ray tracing, but it works, of course. Any questions? Should I go into detail here? No, I didn't expect that. Another thing is uh, language interpreters. This uh, top, I, I brought this topic on the slide because I wanted to show a project of mine, which uh, this is not really per se interesting. 
you all know that you can write language interpreters with PHP as from your favorite template engine or something like this. Good. I want to show you a somehow way out. Uh, you, call it, you usually call it esoteric programming languages. It's a two-dimensional brain uh, uh, language similar to BrainFuck working on images and a visual PHP IDE for this. Let's show just a short example. Um, the usual 99 bottles of beer example. It works. Why is the screen so fucking slow? It's not the program that is so slow, <laughs> even it's PHP. Um, yes, I just bought it. I don't know what happens here. Okay, um, the actual program is a very small image. You can't recognize anything, I think. It's a bit dark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the basic concept of the language is um, in normal uh, languages you are using ASCII to describe your program. This language takes each pixel as a four tuple uh, of the colors, red, green, blue, alpha, and uses each of those channels uh, for, for some special st stuff. Like the alpha channel defines some comments, the red channel uh, is an 8 bit bit mask which defines in which directions the interpreters which are walking over the image spawn, so you have a forking language, which is very good visible with a uh, small IDE, which was really simple to uh, write with PHP, GTK, which makes this image a bit more visible. It's not really good recognizable. Yes, the resizing works not in the optimal way. Okay, um, yes, do you see the small boxes running over the image? Can you see them? Yeah. Those are the interpreters walking over the image and at uh, several points you see them splitting up in two interpreters. Um, this is when, when uh, the red channel defines uh, they should split. This is a uh, just a simple example of a, uh, yes, really not useful programming language interpreted with PHP and PHP GTK. The amazing thing when I, I developed this, uh, the definition, um, the specification for this language and the basic interpreter in about two hours in some evening I, when this idea came to my mind and writing the EDE for this uh, took another five hours or so with PHP GTK, GTK because it's really simple to write applications with this. One thing I want to show you is when you click on the interpreters, they all have uh, his, uh, their own stack. As you can see in the left, I hope. Yes. Um, okay. This is really useless. But um, you may want to check it out. Its uh, link is provided at the end of the slides. Any questions here? I know it's useless. Okay. Um, when we come to PHP GTK, we, um, since some time PHP GTK um, has a great evolution because we are now covering nearly the complete GTA RP with PHP. I think we have uh, 95 or 98 percent of coverage here. So you can do amazing stuff with, uh, with PHP GTK. A project by, by Manuel Pichler and uh, Jakob Westhoff from our user group show those um, now quite common widget systems. You can, of course, write with PHP 2. And they told me it's even faster than a uh, common widget with Python. I have no exact figures here, but... Uh, Why is this so fucking slow? Okay, this is the example. 
We have the common finder bar written in PHP GTK and it works fluently. This is just one example you can do with uh, PHP. Another example, we uh, are supporting, uh, for example, mods embed with PHP GTK, so you can uh, theoretically write your own browser with PHP. Uh, yes? Um, this is another widget. Wow. starts running when you click on it. <laughs> so just to give you an impression uh, what is possible. Any questions here? Anybody wro actually wrote some application with PHP GTK before? I expected this more or less. <laughs> okay, we get to, to the a bit more serious part. It won't be uh, too serious for now. Um, I say, as I said earlier, um, I consider p uh, the PHP technology at all, which is involved when developing ex applications, the complete stack. And you sh always, when you're developing a web application, you're, you need to always think about the stack. Um, it's hard to, to find um, uh, proper terms for, for defining what we have here. On one hand, we have the, the back end, the application server somehow. Uh, containing the web server itself, PHP, perhaps some application server, some caching stuff like, like memcache, APC, and so on. Um, using this application server or backend, we are generating, normally generating some, some static stuff, like mostly markup, but um, I won't, for example, I won't consider SVG as real markup. So, um, yes, I just call it static stuff here. Um, and we have the dynamic stuff. Most common ECMAScript, also known as JavaScript in your browsers, which works with all, except CSS, works quite fine with all those technologies. Um, yes, especially with a combination of PHP, SVG, and ECMAScript, you have you can design really innovative interfaces which are not really known currently or not commonly used uh, in web browsers. They are compatible with all relevant browsers, Internet Explorer of, of course excluded because of its very bad non-existence SVG support, except you installed some proprietary plugins like uh, Adobe SVG plugin and there's a Corel SVG plugin, which sadly both are not any more developed if I'm I think so, at least. Adobe stopped the development of the SVG plugin because um, they took over Macromedia, which has the Flash plugin, and SVG plus ECMAScript is somehow, um, yes, uh, enemy technology then for them. Okay, let's get another example. I showed you earlier the, the ray traced image. It was uh, generated using Image 3D, which is a pair package. Um, we can um, have those interfaces with a complete stack of only open source technologies. There's, there are no proprietary standards like Flash or Silverlight, which, uh, from which we don't know how they will develop anymore. With, especially with Silverlight, we know how Microsoft um, cares about the standards, how they are implementing the standards, and once they are adapted, while well, they change it in a way most, com most commonly that uh, it, isn't it isn't able anymore to support it with open source technology. They did the same with, with their open XML stuff and so on. So scalable vector graphics are a very nice format for, for vector graphic, uh, graphics, as the name says, with gradients, effects, animations, which are not all supported by common browsers. There's a um, sub uh, a, a substandard of SVG, um, which, which is called uh, simple SVG, minimal SVG, some, something like this, which is so currently supported with all browsers, mostly. There are some rendering errors in Firefox 2 with, with gradients, but they do not really count. 
Um, what I want to show you now is um, with Image 3D we can we can output uh, SVG, which can make use of uh, those gradients like this simple cube image, which is nothing really impressive because it's just a 3D graphic uh, rendered using a vector graphic format. But as said earlier, you can combine this, this with, with ECMAScript. This is quite small, I can't get it bigger, bigger now. But um, then you can do real-time animations in your browser, which offers you a great potential of, of, um, of uh, user interfaces you can develop in your browser. You can combine this with, with XHTML requests, of course, and uh, develop a complete interactive uh, application. Any questions here? Um, okay, Firefox and um, Opera are implementing another uh, interesting thing for, for user interfaces, which uh, enables you to, to draw those images even faster. Jakob Westhoff uh, developed a canvas driver, which, are not, which is not using SVG actually, but the uh, Firefox canvas implementation. Um, what wasn't visible with the uh, driver I showed uh, earlier is that you can't rotate uh, the cube in the cubes in all directions because then you need to implement a complete uh, Z buffer in, in JavaScript or uh, priorities list sorting um, for the polygons. With a canvas driver, which is a lot faster, you can uh, develop a complete um, SVG. Uh, 3D renderer in JavaScript so that you can uh, completely uh, uh, free uh, rotate your images generated with image 3D in your browser, which also offers a great possibility of, of user interfaces. A nice thing about uh, this Canvas stuff is that you can easily export uh, PNGs uh, from this. This is a PNG image of the, uh, of the freely rotated uh, image in the browser and um, Jakob also added a possibility to export SVG from it. Um, yes, the, the URL uh, line looks a bit strange now because it's just generating a very bit big da data URL um, which Firefox does not render properly in the URL bar, but it works. Any questions here? There are nice uh, magazines here. <laughs> okay. This um, was completely senseless. Um, 3D rendering with, with PHP is nothing you really want to do because it takes far too much time. Um, but there are more serious uh, use cases for, for this t uh, kind of technology. Um, me and my brother developed an application which is not really live yet um, to, to, uh, to aggregate um, connections between companies to uh, easily search um, like uh, what, what connections uh, does Microsoft have to Google? Have they, uh, are they shareholders of uh, some same sub-companies um, are they working on, on the same products or something like this? Uh, the project should show you all, those da all this data, which um, <coughs> is hard to make really visible to the user and browsable and accessible. We are using um, SVG graphs for this. Um, generated with graphics and, and pimped later with, with some uh, ECMAScript. So you have graphs showing uh, what, uh, oh, this is test data actually, because Easy Systems does not own Axel Springer Verlag and Build here online. <laughs> <laughs> um, the nice thing is that you have, uh, you can integrate such graphics in, in your application and the user can navigate through, through those structures easily, which is very convenient a very convenient interface. There were nice property. 
Yes, okay. This application is not really live here, and this is a testing uh, environment I'm actually using here. So it may happen that it does not fully work. There are some, still some bugs. Uh, the reason why it is not online, online now, but uh, the, the aim of this project is that users can can uh, add relations between companies and companies and products, like they uh, can write articles on uh, on Wikipedia. So we have a we can aggregate those information, which are very hard to get from from uh, companies if you're just searching for it. If you want to know the the relation of uh, some companies, it's it's nearly impossible to get those information now. So we are trying to to. Uh, create a project which solves this issue. Um, yes, this was more or less just browsing a graph generated with GraphWiz. Graph as in the edge node stuff you know from computer science. Um, another even more useful uh, application or use case for this is uh, the other type of graphs, you know, um, more shards. With EasyC Graph, we are developing in the Easy Components. It's possible to, to create very beautiful charts now and um, provide, also provide nice interface because, interfaces because you can also make them clickable. Why is it so slow? The new prompt slowed down my uh, my shell. Ah. Sorry. We are just generating a graph here. There's no. Uh, Obviously, no output on the shell, but an image should be created. This is an SVG image, so we could open it with uh, just an image viewer, like Inkscape SVG, for, uh, uh, from my point of view, the currently best uh, vector graphics editor available. Or we can open it in the browser. Can you see this completely, including the legend, because it's not visible here on the on this screen. So you have a quite beautiful graph here. And the nice thing about this graph is that it's completely clickable. So you can uh, click on, on the price or on the labels or on the agenda, which may provide, for example, um, a user interface to view detailed statistics for some parts of the graph. It matters on your applications, of, of course. So let's show the code to generate this. And there we come to, to some SPL stuff, because we're using SPL in the components to, to provide really nice interfaces. This is a code to generate the graph. You can modify some stuff to, to show it. Um, what you are seeing here is. Um, First, in the t first, we are creating just a, a chart object, which is uh, the normal stuff you are doing every day with PHP. Then we are assigning properties um, to the chart object. What we do not want to have here are public properties which can be filled with every value well you, you may imagine. So we have property checks using, using the interceptors, like underscore underscore get and underscore underscore set. To, to perform value checks and even um, have something like re read-only and write-only properties. I will go in depth here with another example. This is not really a SPL, this is not SPL at all, because this is awa also available in PHP 4. Um, but it's quite handy to, to provide nice interfaces, because this is quite intuitive for the user to just assign some stuff to a property of your chart. And he will get an exception if he does something uh, unexpected, like this should, of course, not work and throw us some exception. Yes. 
we get a value exception here where the user can read what is wrong. As said, I will go into detail on this stuff a bit later. Um, this is where SBL starts. We not only have a property here, but we have, a, we have error access on this property. So you can just add new data sets to display in your chart by uh, assigning them to, to some, some virtual array in your, in your chart. Um, there we can always, um, also perform value checks here, so uh, uh, adding something else than an EZC graph data set will uh, also cause exceptions. And you can perform more checks like it's not possible to uh, in uh, in Py charts to add more than one data set because you can only uh, display one uh, Py in a chart. So, oh, I was too fast again. Um, we get an exception here which just says that we uh, try to insert too many data sets, which uh, does not work here. Um, and we can also provide more interfaces, uh, more setters or array access interfaces uh, for this stuff um, by providing more interfaces, like setting the URL, which will be used to generate the links in the, in the enhanced chart later or highlight one data point uh, which will be moved out slightly in the chart. These are just some options to, to enhance uh, the, the look of the chart. Uh, there are far more available, but this is in the documentation if you really want to use this. This is a comment to actually uh, add the ECMA script to the SVG we created. Um, SPL offers some more uh, interfaces you can implement in your classes which give you access to, to uh, more properties like um, the data set implements uh, as far as I remember countable and uh, iterator for example so we can iterate we should be able to iterate over those data sets Yes, that's what you expected if this would be only an array. But it's actually a complete, um, it's wrapped in an object structure which performs all those type checks. Countable works also. So you just, just can use count on the data set. I do not, I won't do it here because it just does what you expected. Um, some problem with PHP and, and those interfaces in SPL is that not all methods are, array access methods are really do what you would expect when uh, some object really acts as an array. Like normally we are, we would expect reset to uh, reset the array pointer and return the first element of the, of the virtual array which actually does not happen because resets always expects an array but not something which implements traversable or uh, iterator and does an array type cast and actually returns the first property um, of the object. This is true, also true for, for several other array access functions. So you really need to be careful with this. But when implementing array access, you, you need to uh, to impl also implement some method which uh, does the same, it's rewind for the reset functionality. So calling rewind does what you would have expected from reset. No, it does not. It actually should return the first data set, but I'm not sure if uh, rewind enforces this. It does reset the array pointer, otherwise the iterators won't work. So. It just does not return the value here. Perhaps I should file a bug report for this later. 
Any questions here for, for the SPL interfaces? Otherwise, I will, will uh, continue with interceptors. Okay, this is an, implement an example implementation of um, of interceptors and configuration, a simple, very simple configuration class, which um, has several properties you may set with read-only and write-only properties. We are uh, initializing some default properties in an array, in an internal array, which is set to protect it, so we can't access them from, from outside of the class. Um, when now uh, we try uh, to access a property from outside of the class, the method get is called with a property name. So we, what we are doing here is just uh, tr uh, using isset to look up the property in the internal property array and throw a property not found exception if this property is not set. This is far more visible for the user than the common notice that some property is not set because he may disable uh, the, the notices in his PHP uh, ENI or uh, just do not show errors, but an exception will always bubble up and uh, he will definitely notice this. And as expected, you're just returning the pro property value on, on get access. The same for, for set. If a property does not exist, we do not want to set it, just set it in the, prop, in the configuration class because we have a defined set of, uh, of options and we do not want to extend our configuration class with random options created by the user. When you have a standard class in PHP, setting new properties, new public properties which does not exist are just silently created. So if you have a typo in, uh, when using some, some property class and is the, the actual property name when you have a typo there. The property will be silently created even without a e strict notice, I think. So debugging this is very hard and using set with an explicit exception when a property is not existing is also far more visible for the user in this case. What we are doing here is then is uh, switched by the property name um, and perform some type checks. So in the case of the parse, only valid paths are uh, added to the, to the configuration class and nothing else is uh, assigned there. For, um, otherwise, we throw a value exception so the user knows uh, that he uh, added something which is not expected. Block level just performs a, a typecast. And um, for, the, for every else properties, like the DSN, database source name, we uh, throw, throw uh, read-only exceptions, oh, sorry, um, which indicate to the user that this property is not writable. Okay, array exists. Uh, is the ESET method used above just checks if the array key exists in the properties array? Unset just resets the property the, to, the, to its uh, default value, which is also so a functionality you won't get with, with the standard PHP with a standard class because unset would then just set the property to null. So uh, this way you can uh, perform your own stuff like in a configuration class it may be useful to just reset the default values on unset. But this also is um, dangerous because the user might just not expect that uh, the default value is reset so <coughs> this should be really documented well. Otherwise, um, the user might not be able to use your API properly. So this is how we are using this. As expected, we are just setting those properties. Of course, it works. Reading properties, yes. We are reading one property with, which is echoed here. This is ex as is expected. If we are trying to, to uh, set this write-only property, a, as expected, an exception occurs. The read-only property exception as defined in the code. Any questions here? Do you all know this stuff? A um, you mean the initialization of the DSM? 
This, is, uh, this happens here because uh, DSN has no switch case. Mm -hmm. So we are just ending the read-only property exception. Not set properties are handled above. So if the property is not set at, at all, you get the property not found exception. So if you have a typo, you will always notice this, because there's no way around it. Other questions? OK. So what's next? Yes, that was uh, what I just showed you. Um, I think the official time, the normal time slot is over now. Yes, in the plan, this talk is announced uh, uh, with one half hour more time. Um, I'm interested if you want to, uh, to if you all want to, to, uh, uh, to take a look at some other talk, then I would just stop here because this makes sense. Otherwise, I will continue with um, some discussion on active record and uh, object relational mapping. What is your thing? Uh, just please lift your hand if you're interested to take a break and uh, just stop here or continue with the discussion. Okay, this is only one hand. Next talk at 11.15. Yes, so we have about one uh, quarter hour still, still left. Okay. Um, should I go faster so we can have, the, uh, so that I finish at 11? Yes. I think this will be the best. Okay. Now we come to some even more serious stuff. Um, one thing, all, every PHP developer or every web application developer needs to solve is um, the storage of its data. The really common stuff is uh, using some relational database to put all your data in. What this is often not really handy because you need to write your, your manual queries in the, uh, in the normal case and uh, do all the escaping and do all the mapping to your internal objects, object stru tru structure, if you have an object structure, which, I, uh, which is a base I, I just uh, uh, think is, is a, common, a common thing now. And uh, I won't talk about some procedural programming or array handling in, in your application. We are just, uh, the basis, you have some objects in your application, some business objects you want to handle. Um, quite established is now to use uh, some active record mechanism um, to, to map your database rows directly to your object, business objects in your application, like Ruby on Rails does, like Symfony does. Uh, there are dozens of framework which does this. In, um, in other programming environments, there are completely different solutions for this, like the SOAP object database, which is not a relational database, which does not have yet an uh, object relational mapping, so that, you, that the SOAP object database can store its contents into some, some relational database. Um, which is really handy because you can just put your SOAP objects into the database, read it from, the, from there, perform queries on it. But it may be slow because it's implemented completely in Python, but even then it scales quite well. But we are in the PHP world, so um, you perhaps can better contact the SOAP guys, which have a project room here, on details. Another concept which uh, was introduced by Jan Lehnhardt and uh, do you know the Damien? Damien Katz? Danke. Ah, hi. <laughs> um, is, is CouchDB, which is a completely different kind of storage. Jan will have a talk on this in the PHP room at uh, 14 o'clock. You definitely sh uh, should uh, view his talk because it's a really interesting concept. I won't go into details here because I don't know really much about this and Jan is a far better person to talk about this. Um, yes, I just said Ruby on Rails, um, so somebody said Ruby on Rails, because this is uh, the standard, uh, current standard way to do some object relational mapping in your applications. Active record sucks. This is my opinion. Um, no, it's not completely true because the common use case of uh, 
the common way Active Record is used in, in current web applications, just sucks. Uh, Active Record can be useful. I do not really like it, but it may be useful. But one thing is, of course, true. It's no object relational mapping. Um, do you all know what I mean when I say Active Record? Is there anybody who don't know Active Record? Okay. Oh, those are quite a lot of hands. Um, Yes, damn, I have no bot here. <laughs> um, I'll try to explain it with my words. What you're doing with Active Record um, is you have some table with a lot of uh, columns and you map those columns to properties in your objects, in your object structure. Um, so if you have a table containing uh, some, some news on your website, you have normally have an author, uh, a title and a text, for example. So you get objects in your application which have those properties, author, uh, title, text, and you can uh, just change one of those properties and call, call save or update on the object and it will be uh, updated in the database, which is really handy because you do not need to write any SQL. Um, also, you, you normally can just create a new object article, assign the properties and just uh, call insert and it's saved in the database. So all the, the SQL black magic happens in the background. Um, there's one problem with this concept. Ah, one, one more thing I need to say here. Um, the author in, in your, your news, data, uh, news table is normally an just an identifier which maps to some author table. This is also no, normally no problem with uh, active record because you uh, call something like uh, fetch author or some uh, active record implementation to do this automatically. So the author information is also fetched from the author table. You, so you get a sub object in your, in your article object which contains, let's say, the author name, author email address and address and so on. Was it clear? Good. Um, this is a, co a, a quite common way now to, to map your application business objects to your relational database. But, but this concept has several really weak sides. Like normally in, in, uh, more, in, in uh, more established web applications, you want some versioning for your articles, like Wikipedia does for their articles. So if somebody change, changes an article, you want to, to always have the, the last revision of, also have the last revision of the article so you can revert his changes. This is very hard to do with, active, with just an object relational mapping using active record, because you need some, some column like a version in your table and uh, you do not have a unique ID for an article anymore because it would uh, duplicate for several versions, so you need an a, a, a aggregated identifier, um, an aggregated primary key, which is not supported. I don't know if it's supported by any of the active record implementations, but it's also very ugly to have several versions of an article in one table. Next problem is internet, uh, internally, I hate this word, internet -lization. you know, it's, it's on the slides. <laughs> um, you would like to, to add some, some keys for the language in the, the article is, and to provide it in the several languages. So you get another column with another ID for the languages and uh, it, it blows up your table and uh, you have complex keys which you can't uh, just fetch anymore. And, it just not works with the, with the normal uh, active record implementations. Or does anybody know an active record implementation which handles this properly? That's what I thought. <laughs> um, the problem is, the consequence of those to both topics, it either destroys your business objects, so you have broken objects in your application, or it destroys or, or and it destroys your uh, relational DB scheme. So one thing you always should remember, active record is not an object relational mapping. Um, another very severe problem is that you can't, um, have, can't really have end to M relations with 
uh, some assigned meter data in, in your uh, active record if you're using this as uh, an ob object relational mapping because you need another table with uh, bo the IDs of, of uh, both elements of the relation and the meter data, which would result with active record in another object in your business object structure, which is plain wrong because you normally want this meter data in one of those both objects or object arrays. Another example, which is perhaps more family, familiar to you, is uh, a store where you have product uh, variants, like uh, different colors for t-shirts or yes, something like this. It will get really hard to, to implement this with, uh, with uh, active record as an ORM. Um, it will get even harder if you have several different articles which have f completely different columns. Um, the concept of business.org, I showed you earlier, has this end to M relations with metadata like, uh, like the person uh, some company owns of another and uh, yes. To do this thing right gets a lot harder. I show you an extract from, from uh, the uh, DB schema of business which does the object relational mapping for, for business. This is a quite complex structure, but it does the object relational mapping properly. Um, you can consider different objects you have in your application, content objects you have in your applications, like the articles or uh, t-shirt in your shop or the cup in your shop, like uh, objects, like content objects. Those content objects can be defined by, by some kind of content classes. Um, here uh, mapped to a table content type which just has the ID and the name, which contains several attributes like the color of a t-shirt or the name of the, of the cup or the text on the cup, which are of some uh, attribute type like string, ID, price or whatever. Um, then you have instances of, um, of those content classes in your ob object table, which also have a name and of course an object type, which may have several versions with several languages. C uh, creators are always stored for each version of those objects, which have data for, for each attribute defined in your content class. And um, in business, they also have a state like, um, what is it? Like this was uh, just spam because we do not delete anything, of course. And uh, this was, was crap somebody wrote. So we need to store state there too, which would make active record even more complicated. Can you see the sense behind this model? Who does not see any sense behind this model? Okay, um, you can widen this approach even more. In Easy Publish, we uh, have a somehow similar model, but with some, some quite strange additions we, which were required for some of our customers. Like in Easy Publish, we uh, also translate and version the object classes, which is the object uh, type table here. So we may have different attributes depending on the language the object is created in and have and version the object class tables. The, um, the, the uh, DB structure gets a bit blown up. It's quite hard to, to query it directly when you are writing your SQL by hand, but uh, wrapping this in a nice application, uh, abstraction layer, you still just can't put your objects into the, into the database. They are stored properly. They are properly searchable by the right columns. And um, because you only need to search the data column in the object data table, this is the only uh, uh, column which may contain, which will contain your real data at the end. Okay, any questions? I know this is a bit crazy, and this is just a trivial idea of an object relation and mapping. There are other um, mappings you can define, like, mapping the, uh, uh, like defining the mapping in a database or Midgard does it in some X, uh, XML files, you said. Um, so 
this depends on your needs, where you define this mapping or how you define this mapping. And it may make sense that you have a, a special table for your articles and define or let somebody define the mappings of your business objects to those tables in some special uh, XML files. Where's the actual use of active record then? Um, you may wrap those access to the tables I show you in, in the model uh, using active records. This may be overhead, but it may be really convenient. Actually, we do this in Easy Publish. Um, we, have an, we have an active record implementation, a quite small one, which wraps all uh, table accesses. But on top of it, uh, um, the model I showed you earlier. If you have a very simple application to develop, like just a, a CD store for, for, your, for your father or for a customer which, which do not have great requirements, active record may fit your needs as an object relational mapping. But hope that you don't get a bit more complex models like variations in uh, CDs or Sometimes the, the CDs also contain uh, games and you need to, to store this in your database and you get problems, as described earlier. Any questions here? Okay. So now um, at the end, thanks for listening. I hope I inspired you a bit with, with uh, the crazy stuff at the beginning to use the co technologies perhaps in some way you didn't think before of. Any questions left? Yes. So um, you, you did use, at the end, I just tried to follow your, uh, you, you set up the database sheet, and then you did use um, active record to access the table. But in, in business, I'm not doing this, because I think it's just overhead. I have one query, it is about 80 or 100 lines, which just gets me the uh, most recent object in one language on all the metadata I need and map it to my internal object structure. But you may use it if you want, if your developers can't write as a SQL. <laughs> Perhaps, yes, but um, I never uh, actually use Propel, but um, I would expect uh, that it gets quite slow using uh, Propel on such a complex uh, relation structure between tables. Because for the for, uh, most recent version of an object, you need to fetch seven tables, data of seven tables, and the most active record implementations do this on request and cannot build a complex joint structure for your queries you need here. So Propel would perhaps perform 20 queries or something like this to, to just fetch one object from your database. And this will take a lot of time, of course. So probably also depends on the kind of application you're doing. Yes. In Easy Publish, as I said, we are using this, but um, we have an excessive, extensive caching me mechanism which uh, makes this reasonably fast. But we are having some problems with optimizing some queries if for very uh, high traffic sites, or that's where we end then, of course. But it may be it may be useful and pro uh, for you. Any more questions? Okay, the links are at the end of the slide. I will upload it very soon. In about 50 minute, minutes, it will be uploaded on my, on my website. If you want to check out some of the projects, thanks for, the, for listening. I've been quite busy about this, this magic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so we have much time to, to um, get fresh air or a drink. I hope to see you later in half an hour at 11.45 for our talk about the Wiki Trio topic. Thank you.
Gordon.